Well, hello everybody. Welcome to Blue Marble Science. Nathan Oakley and Quantum Erasers curved adjacent nonsense. Of course, they're wrong as usual. Warning. Severe facial and monitor damage alert is in effect. Get out those oven mitts. Push the monitors back out of punching range. And let's light this dumpster fire and have some fun. Here's Nathan Oakley and Quantum Eraser berating a guy named Highlander over the method Al Barini used to estimate the radius of the Earth. Let's give a listen. And not just welcome to flat Earth. Welcome to geometry. Yep. They have no clue. Highlander, do you understand what he's asking you for the past, I don't know, 40 minutes? Let me break it down for you. He's asking, why did Al Baruni use planar trigonometry to conclude a spherical radius? That's the question. Huh? Huh? Okay, let me try it again. So you understand now, Al Bruni's got to have a flat earth underneath this mountain to get this triangle. He couldn't do it if it was curved, because he wouldn't have a he wouldn't have a flat baseline. Maybe maybe interrupt the devastating fact that he couldn't do the measurement if it was curved, or maybe laugh in the face of the fact he can't do this unless it's flat. It's got to be. He can't make a triangle unless it's flat. Do you understand that part? Geometrically illiterate globe. Yeah, I know. You don't like being told that there are no flat surfaces on a sphere or that Al Baruni is absolutely measuring a flat plane to get his height of the mountain. You don't like these things, sphere believer. You can't tolerate them. You give me a high-pitched squealing giggle when you hear them, don't you? So funny, Nathan. So what's the argument? Well, you know, according to Nathan and QE, you can't have an angle between two curved lines or a curved line and a straight line. And that's just pure nonsense. This is taken straight out of Wikipedia. The angle between the two curves at P is defined as the angle between the tangents A and B at P. This is not a new concept. This has been around since the time of Euclid. But it doesn't have to be necessarily two curves. It can be a straight line and a curve. There's a straight line, there's a curved line. The angle between the straight line and the curved line is the angle between that line and the tangent to the curve at the point the line intersects the curve. By definition, that's the angle. That was nice, that, wasn't it? Oh, thanks, Bev. Level is horizontal. No, level is not horizontal. And I'm going to do a special video for you on that. But hang around. You still might learn something anyway. Al Baruni was an 11th century scholar, mathematician, among other things. Also known as the father of modern day geodesy. You do realize that requires a geoid. Anyway, Al Baruni developed a method to estimate the radius of the earth by measuring angular drop to the horizon from a known elevation. Notice I said estimate not exactimate. This is an approximate method and atmospheric refraction will affect the results, but it'll give you a reasonable answer under most conditions. It works like this. You find a nice mountain someplace and you measure the height of the mountain. Then you take an astrolabe to the top of the mountain and you sight the horizon at some point like C on that diagram. That gives you angle alpha. You now know the height of the mountain and you know alpha, which is the dip to the horizon. And you simply plug it into Al Baruni's simple equation shown there on the bottom left and you get an approximate radius of the earth. Now here's the problem. Flat earthers are absolutely terrible at looking at a cartoon like this and trying to relate it to reality. It's only drawn this way for clarity, but what they see in their minds is a triangle that looks like that, with nothing approaching a right angle and a great big whopping curve in the bottom of it. What they fail to realize is if that were the Earth, you're looking at a distance across the surface of maybe 2,000 miles. That's absolutely ridiculous. 
You have a hard enough time seeing the horizon 50 miles away, much less 2,000 miles, and most of the time it's more like a couple of miles. But there's another point to be made here. Al Biruni used a device called an astrolabe, and an astrolabe is a gravity device. It hangs like a plumb bob, and the measurement is actually made to a perpendicular to that plumb line. That line is this line. The surface of the earth is now being used to make this measurement. Only a visible point on the horizon, that's it. The measurement is being made from a level line at the point of observation. That's what angle alpha is measured from. So Nathan's assertion that we're using a curved adjacent is just flat nonsense. Now, Nathan and QE see a diagram like we have on the right, and they instantly insist that the Earth has got to be flat to make the measurements. Frankly, those two are too geometrically challenged to figure this out. So let's see if we can help them. Have a look at the diagram. First, we need to find ourselves a nice mountain, like that one. Then we need to find a nice beach next to the mountain and a point on that beach where we can make an angular measurement to the top of the mountain. Then we need to move a known distance from that point and make a second angular measurement. So now we know the two angles and we know the distance between the measurements. All we've got to do is plug those numbers into that formula and we arrive at the height of the mountain. It's that simple. Now again, we're using the astrolabe to make these measurements. So at no point does the shape of the surface we're standing on make any difference. Those angular measurements are made with respect to a line that is perpendicular to the plumb line at the point of the measurement. They have nothing to do with the shape of the surface, flat, curved, or otherwise. This is exactly the mistake flat earthers make when they try to understand sextants and how they operate. Now let's have a look at a drawing that's made to scale. There's the little diagram we saw. So we start by picking a point on the top of the mountain. Next, we pick the first point that we want to make a measurement from, and from that, we measure the angle to that point on the mountain. That's angle alpha. Next, we pick a second point, a known distance away, and measure that angle. We call that one beta. Now, if we plug in the known distance between those two points, in this case, 5,280 feet, and those two angles into that formula, we get a mountain height of 1,999.98 feet. That compares very favorably with my scale drawing, which was 2,000 feet. Again, keep in mind that that measurement is being made with an astrolabe. It only knows the direction of gravity and the angular scale is relative to a perpendicular to the direction of gravity. So the shape of the so-called baseline never comes into play. Only that line perpendicular to the direction of gravity. No baseline is involved. Here's the globe model. Now, if you're looking at this thinking that that baseline is straight, it isn't. That is a curved baseline. I'm going to show that to you in a minute. Notice that before we had a predicted height of the mountain of 1,999.98 feet. Now, we've got slightly different angles for alpha. Beta remained constant. Alpha didn't. Angle alpha increased slightly. And that results in a predicted height of 1,997.792 feet, off by 2.2 feet, roughly. There's a reason for that. If the gravity vector is that direction when we're measuring angle beta, the gravity vectors are not parallel. When we measure angle alpha, the gravity vector, this is exaggerated, 
is tilted like that. So you get a slightly larger angle. And that's what results in that error. Now let's have a close-up look down on that end. Remember I told you that that is not a straight line. That is actually an arc. And it results in a displacement, a drop if you will, of 32 inches from the point where we measured angle beta. There's the curved line representing the ellipsoid. There's the radius of 20,900,000 feet. The total area is about 4.86 feet, less than five feet difference. Will that matter? I don't know, let's find out. Here are the two scenarios in Walter Bilson's Earth Curve Calculator. If we start with what Alberini would have measured, and if we plug that mountain height and that dip angle into the equation Alberini developed, we end up with a radius of 3949.112 miles. Now let's go to the globe model and use the 2003 foot elevation. I'm going to keep that dip angle the same. And when we do that, we end up with a radius of 3958.759 miles. Only about a 10 mile difference in radius, that's all. Now these numbers are unrefracted and this is where the error in the Alberini method comes into play. If we include refraction, we get a measurement that's going to be about 175 miles greater. That's using a mild refraction factor of about 0 0.04. Standard refraction is around 0.16. So this is the reason that the Alberini method is a bit unreliable in terms of precision, but perfectly demonstrates the curvature of the Earth. Now there's one more thing I want to point out. There's the flat plane model on the left and the globe model on the right. What's the length of that line that the flat earthers like to call the baseline? Well, we can measure that. AutoCAD tells us that the length of that line is 10,560 feet, exactly two miles. What happens when we do the same thing with that curved line on the globe model? The length is still 10,560.0004 feet. This is why if we want to, we can treat that so-called baseline as if it is a straight line. Even though it's got a slight curvature, it really makes no difference. You know, two miles is less than 0 0.03 degrees of the surface of the Earth. If we carry that out to a full degree, that's 69 statute miles. The difference in the cord length and the arc length is less than five feet. Nathan, your curved adjacent argument is simply a red herring. You guys are gonna need to do better than that. I got an idea. Why don't you do this? Why don't you show us how you can take a sextant and find your position on the flat earth? That would be really interesting. Hey, thanks for watching. Hope you guys enjoyed it. Don't forget those little buttons down there. Shout out to the members, the patrons, PayPals. I appreciate everything you guys do. And I'll see you on the next one.